Set it up. 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 You ready? Yes, you. You're watching the best of Set It Up 2012. Enjoy. And in five, four, three. Good morning, boys and girls. My name is Brian Jones. Woo! Brian! And today, I'm gonna teach you a little bit about puppets. I'm gonna create my own puppet and then bring it to life. On my way, I'm gonna speak to a few puppeteers about how they create their puppets and how they make the magic happen. Let's see how it's done. Yay! Puppets are freaking awesome. Puppets, man, they're freaking awesome. Uh, my name is Troy LeFay. I'm one of the uh, co-producers of Transylvania Television. I play one of the characters on the show, uh, a, a character named Archie Leach, who is an actual leech. And I am the videographer for most of most of the stuff that we shoot. My name is Gordon Smooter. Um, my in in my day job, my professional job, I am a prop builder. Uh, I make props and special effects for television commercials and still photography. There, there seems to be a thing where puppeteers have loved puppets since they were kids, and they just get into it. Um, that's kind of the what happened with me. You know, this kind of thing, <laughs> like I say, only came along later in life when I hit my midlife crisis and decided to start a puppet show. I developed, along with some friends, a uh, web show called Transylvania Television. It's about, uh, well, it's all puppets. It's for grown-ups. It's not for kids. Uh, and it's all about a vampire who starts a TV station. Uh, my name is Susan Nussel. I'm an animator and a puppeteer of sorts. Most of my puppeteering skills um, I've translated into the form of animation. Um, so I make a lot of my money by creating animated characters. So basically I make a lot of 2D puppets that are manipulated in the computer and I make a lot of um, three-dimensional puppets that are then <laughs> manipulated live and captured digitally and then digitally um, manipulated. Yeah, just watching Sesame Street and just being totally enthralled with Little Grover and Telly the Monster and all those characters. Puppetry is not dead, it's just sort of been in this odd transitional state.
and I'm watching it on the monitor there I just I so love doing that creating the character like I really I'm all about character and like bringing certain aspects of characters to life I think it's just working with the people we have kind of an unusual collection of people that work on the show and uh, we have uh, an enormous amount of fun, probably more fun than you should for the amount of work that we have to put in. So. The most difficult part of acting the puppets is getting used to doing everything backwards <laughs> um, because of the, the way that the camera sees it isn't the way that you see it and so you're having to hide you know, yourself underneath the table and you have your hand up here and you can't be looking up here at your puppet to see what it's doing. You have to be looking at this little monitor down here, which is actually the opposite of what they're seeing on the camera. So getting used to that kind of like opposite world takes a lot of practice. You're worried about trying to keep people's arms and heads and things out of the shot, which um, is, is not very easy to do. And it also adds uh, a, a, an additional technical challenge because everything tends to be four or five feet off the ground, um, so your camera has to be that high. You're not doing it blind. Um, you always have a monitor that you can see exactly what the camera is seeing, so you know what your puppet looks like on screen, and that's extremely important. The difficulty in that is getting my actual design to be like the images in my head of what I want it to be. I'm trying to figure out like, okay, I want his head this big, so now I have to like visualize that and then I have to like break it down into a flat form and then figure out how that flat form is gonna be reconstructed into the 3D form. The, the, the character that's being expressed by that puppet, you have to build in all of the little things that you want that puppet to um, exude um, and uh, uh, the look of a puppet is very very critical um, the, the, it's like the look of a cartoon character from the very beginning when you draw a pencil sketch uh, of what you think this character is going to be like and you start developing that all the way out to when you put it on and you give it a performance I really, I, I, I don't see a separation anywhere in there. Welcome back everybody. It's been a long and vigorous journey. I've learned that creating controlling puppets isn't as easy as it seems. Puppeteers have amazing skills of making things look easier than what they really are. Isn't that right, Doug? Yep, Trian, that's right. I mean, you can't even control me. <laughs> that's Doug. Well, hey it seems that our time has run short. Hopefully we'll see you guys again on the next episode. Woo!
Hi, my name is Ari. When I found out that 6% of the people in the United States are vegetarian, I tried to be one myself. Now here's my video log on how that turned out. Okay, so egg and cheese omelet and zucchini pecan bread. I'm good. So today is chicken filet, Italian dunkers with marinara. The, I could eat that. Taco with beef. Wait, where's Italian dunkers? That line over there. So for dinner, let's see. Um, what are you eating? Paella? Paella. Pork and chicken. Pork and chicken, okay. And then let's see, here we have chicken, um, taco meat, <laughs> and a sausage. Okay. Um, down here we have lettuce. Broccoli. Asparagus. Asparagus. Lettuce. Mushrooms. Tortilla, broccoli, carrots. Our beans are vegetarian. Right? Mm -hmm. Bean and cheese tortilla with lettuce. One, two. But it's like spongy, and when I squeeze it, it it oozes. <laughs> I'm gonna have some real meat. Today's my last day. Doom. Ding.
A special thanks to Andrew Lanis and Randy Tallis. Fashion means to me uh, an expression of oneself. I think my tattoos for me personally are a form of expression because they are completely unique to myself. Um, I try to have different tattoos than other people have. The first thing you see when you see someone is their hair, their face, or their body shape. It depends on whatever you're looking at, but their hair is there. I would say it's self expression just because you know every every facet of uh, of the whole art form is unique uh, to the artist uh, the way you dress is it's a social expression that people interact visually on that level and everyone has to dress themselves every day so what you choose to wear is an expression of yourself that's my belief <laughs> You're getting this right, this is golden. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Sarah Epperson, or Sarah Jane, and I work at Beloved Studios, and I am a professional custom tattoo artist. Uh, my name is Dan Clausens. I also work at Beloved Studios, and I am also a professional custom tattoo artist. I think my tattoos for me personally are a form of expression because they are completely unique to myself. I try to draw lots of my own tattoos or the tattoos that I do get. Um, I collect on my travels all over the country, so I think they're a form of expression for a lot of people because they set them apart. Even like in the tattoo community, they can all be... you can be completely different than the other person. Like me and Dan, we don't have any tattoos in common. His tattoos mean something for him and mine means something for me. It, it was a great opportunity for me to believe in myself. There's tons of kids that are really creative at all kinds of different things and, um, and I think older generation and your peers as well uh, really need to like call that out in you and like really embrace that if you have an, a creative gifting whether it be for fashion or music um, or drawing painting any of that like you need to really embrace that and uh, in whatever in whatever way you can and this has uh, helped us all like embrace our just our, our giftings and it, it's it's really really wonderful I'm super grateful well that's what tattoos are they help mm -hmm pull out those things that you can't initially see in somebody and, be, and then you get to see them 
It's like you're, you get to walk with what you love. My name is Erica Carter and I'm a licensed cosmetologist, which means I do hair and makeup and I can also give you information in regards to your skin. As far as um, fashion, the world of fashion, it all kind of links together because it's all about expressing yourself and one's creativity. And just like a um, fashion designer gets creative with her clothing or his clothing, so does a stylist. When we're doing hair, we have to be real creative. You're either gonna be dramatic, you're gonna be subtle, you're going to be, um, you'll do a natural look. It all ties together because it's all about getting the job done. It's one of my passions. I love to make people feel good about themselves. And I think when you get your hair done, it opens another or inner you. It's like, oh, earlier I had on sweatpants, but my hair was done. So I'm still cute. My personal fashion sense has been changing. Uh, it always does. I think fashion is always evolving. It's always um, it's always changing because the, the trendsetters, people who are really pushing pushing you know new concepts of ways to dress oneself. I think it's always evolving. There's always ideas that you can get from the past and the history in fashion. In streetwear, I think the inspiration can be from anywhere. And, um, you know, it can be from just colors in the changing of the seasons, like in fall, there's a lot of like the reds and oranges. You might see that on, you know, a graphic on a shirt, just that try and mimic those colors. I think inspiration can come from anywhere. But first and foremost, for me, it, it, it comes from the history of fashion, the trends that have evolved, and then also um, just everyday life, what you see around you. I think you can be inspired by what you hear and what you see.
In the memory of injustice, in the memory of Feng Li, in the memory of all victims of police brutality, in the memory of a tragedy translated to travesty, in the memory of a planted gun, conspiracies and sons lost over the sun. The videotape was lost and they thought it was all done. They were wrong. Three shots in the back, five shots on the ground, one sun down, bleeding on the round. In July 2006, Fung Lee and some of his friends were riding bikes um, over on the in North Minneapolis, close to where they live, actually at City View Elementary School. Um, officer, Minneapolis Police Officer Jason Anderson and a state trooper um, saw the young men biking around. And drove towards them because the car said they apparently saw them pass things to each other. They actually ended up, uh, a, a, a short chase um, entailed, um, Feng Li was kind of singled out as his other, other friends dispersed on bike or on, on foot. And uh, the squad car actually ended up, I think, I believe, ramming into Fong's, Fong's bike. Fong then took off running. So Fong Li was being chased by Officer Jason Anderson, and Jason Anderson pulled out a gun, and the surveillance camera caught Fung Lee uh, running ar around the school and it seemed like he was unarmed because it didn't see look like there was a gun in his hand. Um, but uh, Jason Anderson, saw Jason Anderson shooting him and so what it showed after math was that Fung Lee was shot in the back three times and then on the ground five more times. The police department, Jason Anderson, um, have, had maintained around and saying that the reason why they initially stopped and pursued Feng Li was because they said that he had a gun. They, um, Anderson said that he was shooting Feng Li because uh, he, his life was threatened because Feng Li had a gun on him and was going to shoot him. Um, and um, this is important because the, the gun that was actually found next to Feng Li's body was um, at, first of all, it had no, uh, no uh, DNA evidence on it, no kind of trace evidence. There's no blood, no fiber, no fingerprints, no smudges on the gun. The gun also wasn't turned into evidence until 72 hours after he, after he died. Um, and moreover, the gun that was found next to his body um, was stolen in 2004, and the, the previous owner testified that it had been recovered by the police um, and had been held in police custody. Um, up until then, which highly strongly indicates that, that the gun was planted and that this, that this was a cover-up. His generation are the grandsons of a secret army that sacrificed to save the backs of soldiers and shooting teenagers in the back would never achieve a medal of bravery unless they thought he was a refugee from Southeast. The police pulled over civics and Toyotas at the rate of heartbeats. In 2009, his family filed a, a wrongful death lawsuit against the city of Minneapolis and specifically um, Officer Jason Anderson. But I know that they, they took the city of Minneapolis to court many times and they lost every single time but continued pursuing different ways of, um, different ways of finding a path to justice for their son. And so um, it went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court uh, made a decision not to hear the case. And moreover, the, the friends that Fung Lee was with um, testified in, in court saying that Fung was, was un unarmed, completely unarmed, and d did not have a gun. Uh, there's overwhelming evidence that uh, Fung Lee didn't have a gun in his hand. Officer Jason Anderson, um, this guy uh, joined the police force in 2005, so he was a rookie cop at the time that he killed Feng Li. He was just uh, on the force not even a year, I think 11 months um, uh, into when, this, when, when, Feng, when Feng was murdered. And Officer Anderson has a history of excessive force, especially towards young people of color. And uh, even there's another case where he kicked an African-American teenager in the head after he had already been handcuffed. Why well, I, I, it's 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 incredibly important to continue to um, to to, ed to spread education um, specifically about this piece. Um, so at the end, that you know, ultimately, hopefully, one day, this these instances won't will not be happening any anymore. When you when a situation like this doesn't get justice, you know, um, there's a sense of 
you know, how can we succeed in a society that is stacked against us as Asian American, you know, and <clears throat> so, or just someone of color or just someone that lives, a young person that lives in the Minneapolis area. And whether it's, you know, through uh, the court system eventually or whether it's through people and community members, individuals feeling empowered and saying, you know, we've had enough and, and, and demanding for some, some real change. In, in terms of the way, um, in terms of the way the way things are done, I think it's it's in, it's incredibly important to to keep fighting. We will not be silent to sirens of cyanide on our side of the city because it's not injustice for just us. There's a whole history of conspiracy. Stand with me because the next tragedy could be in your family. So we suffocate from this case, skeptical to breathe, and only justice will give us the oxygen to be treated like human beings in the memory of injustice, dedicated to the family of Fung Lee and all victims of police brutality, rest in peace. People don't think of much when they think of St. Paul, but for those who are from here, we know there's a reason we stick around. Built on the back of industry, we have survived this collapse where so many others have fallen. While some may call us crazy for living here, the winter defines us, has made us stronger, hardier, and we will always persevere. But this city isn't done. We're always building, always adding, always growing. The water of the mighty Mississippi roars through our veins, constant, strong, unchanging, a reflection of our spirit and a symbol of our values. And as long as it lives on, so will we. Okay, so I don't think I could pick a single memory as being my favorite. Um, there's a knock on the door and Meet Kyle was there. And I didn't know who he was at first. I kind of didn't really like him at first. But um, he's not like a really good friend, so that's my favorite memory. Stands out. Where we ordered all of that pizza from, or was it Pizza Luce or something? And we all ate it in here. But Destiny ate all of Dorado's chicken wings and it was just... It was fun and it was relaxed and we weren't working on anything and it was just, it was nice and fun and food, food's always good. My favorite memory of Set It Up, especially this year, would probably have to be how involved and organized we were for the first episode. From this year, uh, I liked the studio shooting of the second episode. I think that was pretty fun. Destiny, Dorartu, and I were interviewing for, uh, I believe it was Destiny's piece, and we were asking people like about the food they'd eaten, and there was just, I mean it was just that day, everyone was telling us about all this good food, and we were getting so hungry, and it was really fun just to be like, uh, bonding with people over food, I guess, and just to like, uh, be a part of something bigger than I was. Seeing the crew come together, um, like at the beginning of the year, everyone's kind of new and not everyone knows each other and I think that it's been really cool to see like over time um, people really working together as like a team and a community. My favorite memory this year would have to be fun week because you asking me why because it was fun we had the fun. I would summarize this year of Set Up in one word, and that word would be eventful. Amazing. I miss it. Creativity. If I can describe Espina in one animal, it would have to be the white tiger. They are the animal to be, just like how Espina set it up as a place to be. 
I think if I were to sum it up in a word, yeah, I'm an overachiever. One word would be friendship because that's what you get when you come to set it up. There's this quote by a group of Aboriginal women in Australia that goes something along the lines of, if you've come to change my life, then forget about it. But if you've come because your life is intertwined with mine, then let's do something. I have to say it's been a really fun to work with everyone. It has been the most fun school related thing I've ever done. Enjoyed like every moment here and it's been really great time for me. This is my family. This has been my home since I was 14. I guess if I could, you know, there's a song I know that probably describes set it up and uh, it probably would have to be uh, Love Can Build a Bridge by Winona Judd. Love can build a bridge between your heart and mine. All it takes is time. All it takes is time. Oh, sometimes I get a good feeling. Yeah. No, 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 no